capture uh, the richness of informing processes. So with that brief introduction, what I want to do is talk a little bit of some of the areas that we have pursued in informing science research over the last 10 years and how the field is changing to some extent. And after I've done that quick review, uh, what I'll then do is talk about my own wish list of what I'd like to see uh, done over the next few decades. So um, the first area involves the evolution and creation of informing systems. Now if you take a look at uh, uh, Eli Cohen's original article in the field, uh, one of his uh, principal reasons for defining informing science as a field, at any rate, if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, uh, you have an information-using environment. That particular environment is different for every single field that, that studies informing. So, uh, in that respect, every field seems to differ. On the other hand, the delivery environments are often common. We use the same technologies to inform in many, many different disciplines, computer technologies, face-to-face -face communications, and so forth. So there's a lot of overlap there, and there's also a lot of overlap in the way that informing systems are designed, uh, at least it, as a starting point. Uh, you typically need some entity that's responsible for creating overall designs or plan creations. Uh, you know, this creates the model that we're going to use. We need a um, system for actually building informing systems. For example, someone at the design level might come up with the architecture of an information system. A software company may create a design for a product like uh, SAP. And then finally, you have instances, the individual informing system that is deployed within a company. And it was recognizing that this type of pattern uh, appears in many disciplines. And the only thing that really differed uh, between these patterns was that lower right-hand block. These were the things that Eli Cohen uh, you know, motivated the development of informing science. Now, what has happened over time is our view of how informing systems evolve has changed as we recognize that this is a pattern for systems by design, but it's not necessarily the pattern by which all information informing systems evolve. Uh, for example, a lot of work uh, has been published in informing science on the notion of a double helix of by which systems evolve. And in this case, what happens is you have one set of, uh, one evolutionary path that involves uh, first order learning through direct informing. Basically, this is more the design type of uh, activity, but you also have a parallel path involving, uh, involving uh, reflection whereby uh, as we reflect on our experience, we adapt the design. And so this type of pattern is much more of an adaptive pattern as opposed to the pure design pattern that we talked about in the first article. They both exist, and part of the challenge that we face is figuring out under which circumstances each pattern is improved. More recently, we're starting to see the development of self-organizing systems. These are systems that seem to emerge without any design whatsoever. And the field of sociology uh, and network, uh, networking has become particularly interested in these systems because these systems have certain common patterns, uh, small worlds, power laws, these types of things evolve in these systems. And uh, what we need to recognize is a great many of the most powerful informing networks follow this type of pattern in their evolution as opposed to design? Well, these are all very important questions because we need to recognize that some systems evolve through design, some systems evolve through adaptation, and some systems seem to self-organize in a spontaneous way. What type of settings tends to lead to the 
production of each type of system. What type of uh, activities are best accomplished by these different types of informing systems? How does technology impact the evolution of these types of systems? All of these are very, very important questions for the field, and it is extremely difficult to answer them from a narrow perspective. Another example of areas that are of interest are what I sometimes call the layers of informing. Uh, if you take a look uh, using sort of the ISA communications model as a, as a sort of a general organizing framework, if you look at informing processes, you have a physical layer at the bottom which represents that which we can actually see, touch, smell, measure, and so forth. Uh, we have a symbolic layer, which basically represents how we conceptually represent the physical layer, those things that we can clearly specify. But in parallel with symbolic processes, we also have what I call visceral processes, which are essentially everything that's non-symbolic. And those things can be very important in communications as well. These things involve emotions, uh, things like body language, uh, uh, things like moods, all of these things don't necessarily follow a symbolic model, but they f are very, very important as far as informing is concerned. Similarly, at the outcome layer, we can see semantic changes. In, in, in informing produces changes in how we model the world, they, changes in meaning. But they can also lead directly to actions that are visible actions basically are particularly interested in the physical to symbolic to action path. And they view that as informing. Well, that's fine. And I think there's a lot we can learn from studying that particular path. But if we limit ourselves to studying that particular path, in 10,000 years, we're not going to make much more progress than we have now because that is just one mechanism that we have. If you're a cognitive psychologist, you follow a similar path, physical to symbolic, except you're more interested in meaning. But once again, uh, as the work in artificial intelligence has shown us, uh, it turns out to be a lot harder to get what you would consider genuine informing, uh, genuine informing uh, processes modeled when you limit yourself in this way. My argument is that what we also need to investigate is this other path where we, you know, everything is a physical layer, but we look at things like uh, emotional content and look at how it affects both meaning and actions. Uh, and uh, some examples of this that uh, Eli provided me with are things like uh, how we inform with art and architecture. Uh, he used the example of a chair can make uh, a sitter feel small or uh, very important, like a throne. Uh, when I uh, got out of my undergraduate school, uh, I became a nuclear submarine officer, and part of the process at that time was to interview with Admiral Rickover, uh, who was the founder of the U.S. submarine pro program. He interviewed every single uh, nuclear submarine candidate at that time. And one of the things that he did was he actually cut about six inches off the legs of the chair that you had to sit in so that when you sat in in front of him, well, first off, you didn't just ease down into it, you went down with a thump because you were expecting it to be six inches taller than it actually was. And the other thing is, he's a fairly small man, but when you're sitting you know, a foot from the floor, he looked a lot bigger. And uh, so there was definitely informing going on there. But it was not informing of a, of a symbolic level. It was very much operating at the visceral level. Uh, dance provides, uh, for many, many uh, thousands of years, things like dance and storytelling, or in before language, just dance, was the way of communicating history. And uh, you know, this is, in a sense, anything that happened for that long is something that we're hardwired 
to accept. And so one of the things that we need to look at is the degree to which these things that were hardwired into us through evolution actually impact the informing processes that we have today, even when we think we're informing in a symbolic level. Uh, music is another form of informing, and I'm not exactly sure what informing uh, music does, but there is, it certainly impacts moods, and it certainly impacts the way we think. Uh, and so another example that I used in a recent book is the question of body language. Uh, if you take a look, uh, if we take a look, there's the upper left hand and the lower right hand uh, um, uh, quadrant of stick figures. Which quadrant indicates greater power and confidence? The upper right hand or the, I mean the upper left hand or the lower right hand? Lower right hand, Everybody, yeah, everyone sees that. Uh, and uh, yet that's not a symbolic thing, but it can have a big impact on education. In fact, in the case method, one of the things they recommend is that you spread your arms out a lot and that sort of thing. Because not only does that convince the audience that you're confident, which makes it easier to inform, but what it also does, it actually affects your own hormones and brain chemistries to make you feel more confident. So, in fact, you should wave your arms around and, you know. So what are some of the visceral types of questions we might ask? Well, you know, interesting question for those of you who are graphic designers. How important are aesthetics in the presentation of content? This is a, I think this is a huge question because if you talk to the graphic designers at my university, uh, they just, they, everything has to be perfect or they just can't accept it. On the other hand, I wrote a paper uh, entitled Quick and Dirty Multimedia with the idea of getting the content out as fast as possible and don't worry about the ums and ahs, they bother you more than the people you're listening to. And that's my theory. The thing is, I don't actually know that it's right or not. Maybe much, maybe being much more professional would be much, much better for my students. What I know is if I make something much more professional, I will never change it. So unless I want to be teaching the uh, same material 15 years from now, <laughs> material that is outdated almost from the time I produce it, it's probably better if I think it's a little crappy, if you'll pardon my expression, because that way I'll be more motivated to change it. These are issues that we need to think about. Question background music. Does background music... They use it in films all the time to increase emotional content. Can we use it to help us affect informing? I don't know. <laughs> That's the point of a research question. Don't ask a research question which you know the answer to. An interesting question, I was just tossing these things up as I was writing the presentation, so this is not a complete list by any chance. These are just examples. But, you know, some art is intended to produce a sort of a shared understanding. On the other hand, if you, uh, you know, if you look at the Mona Lisa, you know, everybody's attracted to the smile and everybody's wondering what it is that, you know, that person is thinking. On the other hand, when you look at a lot of abstract modern art, I, I, it, I do not believe that the artist intended for a single interpretation. You go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, very famous painting is entirely black. Now, I don't know exactly what that means, but I do know the thing is worth millions of dollars, and, and I wish I'd thought of it. Uh, but <laughs> some art is intended to provoke a diversity of in opinions. Now, in all cases,